Hey there, race fans. It's Race Day Top 5 with me, Frank Five. All-Star Night. It's the night where the stars shine. The stars of the sport, that is. And this weekend, we return to an old track that has been with the sport since the beginning, but we took almost a three-year decade from it. And I'm talking about North Wilkesboro, one of the most iconic tracks on the NASCAR circuit that they've ran over the years. Then we took a break, like Ross and Rachel from Friends, and now, this weekend, we return to that historic track for All-Star Night. And one of the stars put on a butt whooping Sunday night. Let's get into all that went down at North Wilkesboro. Number one, Kyle Larson. Young money. Dominant, dominant, dominant on Sunday night as he captured the NASCAR All-Star Race at North Wilkesboro, beating out Bubba Wallace, Tyler Reddick, Chase Briscoe, and Chase Elliott. For the victory and cashing in $1 million for the third time in his career. Kyle Larson has just won three All-Star races in his career. The All-Star race in 2019 at Charlotte Motor Speedway when he was with Chip Ganassi. The All-Star race in 2021, his first year back at NASCAR after the indefinite suspension. And his first year with Hendrick Motorsports at Texas. And in the fourth or fifth different venue to host the All-Star race at North Wilkesboro, Kyle Larson put on a dominant performance. Now, Kyle Larson was not happy with his car in practice this weekend based on what I saw from the time trials. I was kind of puzzled because I felt like he was going to be a contender considering how this track is kind of beneficial to his racing style because it's old out Warner Bracer. It's kind of like a third track, for example. They started in the middle of the field, but right away they went straight to, or actually they started were running in a little bit of the lower part of the field in the top 20 for the most part. Then after caution came out early on in the first segment, he decided to pit with a few others. He actually got penalized for speeding after he uh tail in the longest line, but he came through that field like a rocket ship on those tires and he went straight to the lead and never looked fast the rest of the night. I mean, at the end of that segment, the first segment, he was almost 15 seconds clear of second place. That's how dominant that race car was last night. I mean, people are going to get, oh, it's like nostalgia to the All-Star race where Jeff Gordon ran a Jurassic Park paint scheme on his car and he flat out dominated the field and won the All-Star race that night. It was kind of similar to this race car. It was just flat out dominant. He lapped almost half the field. Then obviously the segment ended. Everybody came in and pitted. Larson won the race off pit road. And from there on, he was the control guard the rest of the way. The highest lead he got though in that final segment was about four and a half seconds and the, the, it kind of dwindled between four and a half to 3.8 seconds the final few laps when he caught live traffic but regardless the five car was just flat out dominant and running the truck race on saturday definitely helped him because he was also good in that race and he ended up winning it so larson swept the weekend winning the truck event and the all-star race i mean he put on an ass whooping last night i just cannot believe the speed of the race car and the talent that this guy has and we've seen the last few weeks he's had the speed to win these races now granted this is not a points paying event but it just goes to show you that anywhere we go kyle larson will be in the conversation for the win or will be the one standing in victory lane at the end of the night it was just flat out domination by kyle larson and that five team. They should be proud of the performance and the effort they put in after a pretty rough practice that they had on Friday to go to win the truck race the next day, run well in their heat, and then start having to battle back from the back up to the front at the very end of the segment, or like starting at the back and then working his way to the front. Unbelievable performance by that five car. They were just so, so strong. Kyle Larson has just been flat out good this year. So props to him and Cliff Daniels and the number five team on a dominant performance at the All-Star Race last night. Number two, 2311 Racing with a solid performance. Both drivers finishing on the podium in second and third place. I'm talking about Bubba Wallace and Tyler Reddick. Both of them have been running very well as of late in the regular season point of paying events. They ran both ran very well at Kansas, a track where Bubba has been very good at the past few times we've been there. Tyler Reddick obviously also a track that benefits his racing style. And at Darlington last week, both ran well. Both had to overcome some adversity. Reddick got caught up in a wreck late in the race. Bubba was able to recover from a uh, pit slow pit stop early in the Darlington race and was able to rebound for a fifth place finish and in this race those two kind of were staying around the top 10 top 15 for the first part of the segment until we had that caution came out and they came in with Kyle Larson and they were able to move their way up to the field and gain track position to the start of the final segment and they ran top five the rest of that segment 
the final segment with no issues whatsoever. They just couldn't close the gap on the five card because of how good he was and because he was just putting a gap on everyone based on how he was able to negotiate lap traffic versus the other guys, even though their tires were pretty worn out. But this is good momentum for these two drivers, particularly for a guy like a Bubba Wallace, who's still looking for his first win of the season. And of course, the reason both these guys made the event because they are winners from earlier this year or late last year. Of course, Bubba Wallace won at Kansas last year. Tyler Reddick won at Coda earlier this year, and he also won at both road courses that we ran towards the latter part of last year. Well, he won two of them, actually. He won Road America, and he won the Indianapolis road course. And both of them put on superb performances in that final segment last night to get that second and third place finish. A great night for 2311 Racing. Gets them some momentum heading into next weekend's 600-mile event. So... It, will this carry forward for Bubba Wallace, and could he be a contender going forward to competing for top fives, top tens, and possibly a win? That will be for Fade to decide for him. But regardless, great performance by both of those guys in yesterday's main event. Number three, the Open. Who transferred into the All-Star Race? Well, we had 21 cars locked into the All-Star Race, but we had three spots available from the Open. The top two finishers at the end of the Open, plus the fan vote winner. To start off, the open winner was Josh Berry driving the number 48 car for Alex Bowman, who's still out recovering from the back injury. He might be back this upcoming weekend, by the way. So Barry had to run this open because he didn't have a guaranteed spot because he wasn't a winner from last year, and he hadn't won a race in the events that he'd been a relief driver for Chase Elliott or Alex Bowman this year. So he had to get into the event by winning or being the second-place finisher regarding the drivers in the open he was not eligible for the fan vote considering he didn't really have uh, i mean he would have had a good amount of fans that would vote him in but probably not the support plus he wasn't a full-time cup driver but this racetrack i felt like he was going to be able to make it into the main event because this track is kind of similar to how he grew up racing racing those wheel and modifies and those short tracks and an old abrasive surface this is josh berry's type of racing so he started up on the front row slipped back to second then we had the pit stop at the end of the first segment and the start of the final segment he took the lead on the pit stops exiting pit road held the lead lost the lead then did some shenanigans in front of him which i'm going to get to in a second he took the lead and never looked back that 48 car was good and he just put on a very solid performance despite a few challenges from behind him from second and third place he was able to vault himself into the all-star race the all-star race didn't really go well for him he finished about 16th 17th spot it was kind of a little bit different especially with the track conditions changing finishing or running the race under the lights but nonetheless barry did a very good job getting into the all-star race via winning the open the second transfer was ty gibbs who flat out dominant and the first segment and it looked like he was going to run away with the whole thing then we had the pit subs he lost it he lost a few spots and then at one moment, a few laps after the restart, he was in a little bit of a tussle off turn four with Michael McDowell and Justin Haley. So Gibbs is using the low apron of the track, has his left sides on the concrete surface. McDowell's in the middle, and Haley's up wide up here. Haley tries to come down and block McDowell, but McDowell's got a fender there. And then apparently Ty Gibbs switched himself up towards the 34 and sent the 34 up into the wall, collecting himself and Justin Haley, and effectively knocked Haley out of the race and out of a chance to advance. It... Knocked Michael McDowell out of contention for a spot. He continued on. But he was not done with Ty Gibbs. There was two times in the race where they were lapping Michael McDowell. The first go-around, he remembered what happened to the what the 54 did. So he started racing him hard when they were coming off a of turn two on one lap down the back stretch. And then they go into turn number three. And he's just squeezing him up towards down towards the wall a little bit. And that pushes both of them up the high side and allowed the 48 of Josh Berry to get by. That's why Berry won the open because the 54, the 34 were having a little bit of um, argument basically about that previous incident on the early part of that final segment. So Michael McDowell did it again, but I think the car was still a little too damaged and the tow link was broken. So ultimately he finished two laps down and out of the, any chance to make it in the all-star race. Ty Gibbs advanced. He did apologize and say, you know, that was on me for the incident mcdowell wasn't happy about it, but he made the comment saying i'm not the one to go over there and start something and get a fine for something that we can't afford to pay for because front row motorsports as good, much improved as they've been over the years they still don't necessarily have the budget like a hendrick a gibbs an rcr a team penske or heck even a 2311 team that can pay to afford to pay for a fine for like any sort of uh argument on the racetrack obviously sometimes there's going to be a fine where it comes to nascar saying we don't like the um 
these parts don't meet the rule book, so we're going to have to find you for this. But this is obviously for like on track altercations and stuff that could go a little far as far as the code of conduct on the racetrack. But I mean, I think Michael Medell pretty much sent the message to Ty Gibbs saying, buddy, I didn't appreciate the way you did that to me. Uh, he, I mean, I felt like the moves that he was doing could have possibly not Ty Gibbs out of a chance to make it to the All-Star race and benefit the guy in third who came up short in Eric Amarola, but it didn't. Ty Gibbs got to run the All-Star race, and he did a good job in all honesty. He ran clean and ended up with a ninth place finish at the end of the night. So despite the running with McDowell, Ty Gibbs did a relatively good job in the All-Star race, making it in and having a good run in the top 10. And the final driver in advance was via the fan vote. Of course, the fans could vote for whoever had the most votes. And this weekend, nobody lobbied their fans to vote for more than Noah Gregson, driver the number 42 for Legacy Motor Club. His fans gave him the most votes to vote him into the All-Star race. And I can't believe he made that race via the fan vote because there was an incident, actually, early on in the final segment before the Ty Gibbs, Michael McDowell, Justin Haley incident where there was going down to turn one, there was a little accordion effect at the front with guys trying to get to the bottom because that was the place to be. And Gregson actually braced the inside wall and went up the track and collected a few of the cars like Todd Gilliland, Ty Dillon, Ryan Newman, Chandler Smith, and then effectively knocked Chandler Smith and Todd Gilliland out of the race. Newman continued, but heavily damaged. I thought Gregson's car would have been probably done with the damage sustained, but they got back out there, stayed in the lead up, and they ran top 10 the rest of that open and did what they needed to do and got the call from Clint Boyer in the booth saying, congratulations, your fans have given you the most votes to advance you into the All-Star race. And right away, the 42 team went right to work to fix the car and any suspension damage they needed to change and fix so they could be approved to run the All-Star race. I'm not sure what the rule would have been if they couldn't run it whatsoever. I guess maybe they could have said, we're going to have to move the next guy up to uh, advance the second in voting. I don't know. Well, well, we'll never know. But Gregson was able to fix the car and they were able to get into the All-Star race and run it. They ran almost as high as 11th at one point. Then they slipped back because I think damage was one thing. And, of course, they were using their tires too much. But it was still good to see Noah Gregson get in the All-Star race via the support from his fans. He's really a lot. He's a likable guy. And I think he gained, gained a little bit of fans after the confrontation post-race with Ross Chastain a few weeks ago. Okay, this, but he's still well-liked by the NASCAR fan base. So it was good to see Gregson get in with having the customize those pins for people to say vote Noah Gregson into the All-Star Race. That's that's good marketing there, Noah, to get yourself into the All-Star Race and have your fans support you. It was really good stuff. The Open was very entertaining for the most part, seeing Barry get in, Gibbs get in despite the run-ins with McDowell, and Gregson get in via the fan vote. Good stuff in the Open. Number four, the racing product at North Wilkesboro. Of course, this is the first time we've been here in 27 years since we last ran there. How would I say the racing did last night? Well, for the open, the racing was phenomenal. Battling for position, guys trying to get to the bottom, the tussles at the beginning of the final segment between guys fighting for position, the bottom of the racetrack, the Gibbs, McDowell, and as I mentioned, that was some good stuff. And the battle for the lead, second and third place at the very end was so tense, you could throw a blanket over those guys. It was so much fun to watch. The all-star race, the first part of it, when guys were fighting for position... And then the caution came out for the Stenhouse spin. And then there were guys that were coming through the field on fresh tires. That was some fun, entertaining racing. But when we got into a little bit of a long run, the end of segment one, and we went caution-free all segment two, it kind of got spread out. It was more so like the, you know, train, like all aboard the choo-choo train around the track, everyone hugging the bottom. Nobody wanted to run the top because there's no grip out there. I mean, I mean, it's not so much the tracks, the problem. It wasn't. I mean, obviously, it's the first time we've been here in almost three decades. It really has to do with the car we've got, the next-gen car. What we've seen from this next-gen car since we introduced it last year, it has made mile-and-a-half and, and two-mile tracks so much fun because you wouldn't have said that many years ago with the Gen 6 car and mile-and-a-half tracks. They were kind of average to below average with the fan base. But now with this next-gen car, we're seeing some productive, entertaining racing with this next-gen car. I mean, take a few weeks ago at Kansas. That was the best race of the season. So many comers and goers, so many lead changes, so much jockeying for position. Great battles all around. It was some of the best racing I've seen. Now, Darlington last week, Old Abrasive, it was a good race. Not the best, but it was good. But what we struggle with this next-gen car is on the short tracks, particularly a Bristol, a Martinsville, this type of track in North Wilkesboro and Richmond. Now, I thought the Richmond race over this year, that was very fun. The Martinsville race was a little bit better than last year, but not by much. Obviously, the tire setup was a little bit different, and it's still it's making the cars handle better than what most would consider, and there's not a lot of tire fall-off. We want more tire fall-off 
to create some side-by-side -side action and some bumper bang. Now, were there bumpers applied to some cars last night when they got close to one another? Absolutely. But the best way to pass a guy is if a guy made a mistake getting up off the bottom of the racetrack and running into the high groove, the guy behind is going to gain a lot of tents on the lap. And another thing that I observed last night that I saw from the truck race, nobody was able to run that lower apron where there was no banking down there, the lower apron of the racetrack off of turn two. Because I was watching the truck race on Saturday and I saw Matt Crafton use that apron off of turn two to gain a couple of tenths on the guy in front of him to either catch up to him to race him or try to make a pass. And it worked. But we can't do that with this next-gen car. There were a few times guys last night were trying that, but it was trying to get by lap cars for the most part. Again, I still love short track racing. We are trying to get more short tracks onto the sport schedule. We love Bristol Motor Speedway. We love Martinsville Speedway. We've seen a little bit of improvement with Richmond with this next-gen car. And this is obviously the first time we're back at this facility in 27 years. But we still have work to do on these short tracks with the next-gen car. It's not so much the tire combination. It has to do with the car itself. What are we missing? Are, I mean, do we need to cut down a few more inches of spoiler? Because we've done that this year with the, some of the changes they've introduced. Reducing the front fascia, like underneath the front splitter of the race car. Is there something we got to do? I mean, NASCAR, I'm sure, is still looking into what can we do to make the short track racing better. Because when you looked at that crowd, they've been waiting so long for NASCAR to come to North Wilkesboro. And that crowd this weekend was electric and energetic. And I hate to say it, but they kind of got an, an average to maybe below average all-star race in NASCAR's return to this facility. I know we can do better with this next-gen car on the short tracks. We just need to find the right pieces to make short track racing with this car entertaining for the fans. Now, uh, again, nothing against, you know, this next-gen car on the bigger tracks. But the short tracks, it does need some work. Because the early f first 20, 25 laps of that all-star race last night, they were fun and entertaining. But at the rest of the race, especially after those uh, pit stops and middle of segment one, uh, all before the start of the final segment was just kind of meh for the most part. We have work to do, but I still think we can fix this. It's just going to take, you know, the right pieces to put it all together to put on some great short track racing for the fans with the next gen car. And number five, the return to North Wilkesboro Speedway. Again, it's been 27 years since we've been at this facility. And the whole weekend in general, I felt like, aside from some of the racing product that we saw, the atmosphere was a home run. It was phenomenal. I commend Marcus Smith and Dale Earnhardt Jr. and all the other people involved for getting North Wilkesboro back on the NASCAR schedule. The last time we ran here was 1996 in the fall, September 29th. Jeff Gordon and Ray Everham, his crew chief, they won the final North Wilkesboro race at the time. Now, that was a points-paying race for one thing. After that, Bruton Smith said, we're not coming back here. We're going to introduce the new Texas Motor Speedway. So basically, North, one of North Wilkesboro's races was replaced by Texas Motor Speedway. Now, obviously, a few years after that, have you seen Texas Motor Speedway? It's been very, very fun race track to go to. Now, these last few years, obviously, not so much, especially with the reconfiguration of the track. But North Wilkesboro, like Marcus Smith kept telling Dale Jr., Hey, I haven't forgot about it. I'm trying my best. And Dale Jr. is like, what are you talking about? I mean, we scanned at North Wilkesboro for an iRacing event in 2019. And then last year, we actually had a um, slot car, or like short track car, modified cars run on the racetrack. Dale Jr. was a part of it as well on the racetrack. It was a good event and a lot of fans turned out for that. But the people that turned out this weekend for this event, I mean, unbelievable. I mean, if you saw the crowd for a truck race... On Saturday, that those grandstands were packed, and the grandstands last night were packed. It was a sold-out event. Just so much went into for this event, and it was just good to see North Wilkesboro back on the NASCAR schedule. The Cup drivers took a photo on the start-finish line uh, for the start of the weekend to set introduce NASCAR back to North Wilkesboro. All the drivers lined up for it. Even Kevin Harvick took the chance to take some pictures of the camera guys because he said you need to be part of your part of history we're returning to a track we hadn't been at in years and most of us have never ever driven on at all and it was just a great moment also kevin harvick ran a throwback scheme to his first nascar cup series win from the 2001 atlanta race that he beat jeff gordon out and of course those are the few races after the death of dale earnhardt very iconic paint scheme brought back the number 29 
He changed the number four to the 29 for this one race, and I loved it. He didn't really have the great race last night. He finished the two laps down back in the top 20, but it was good to see that look, that livery on the racetrack again. And we brought back Daryl Waldrop for the All-Star race to call the race on Fox with Mike Joy, Clint Bohr, and Larry McReynolds, too. We had a four-man booth last night. Daryl contributed very well. I felt like he did a very good job with the broadcast. I think for an All-Star race, it does help him. I think points-paying event could have been a little too much on old DW, but for an All-Star race at a track where he's won it 10 times, it was good to have him back. Plus, he gave the command to start engines with the King, Richard Petty, and, of course, both of them very, very successful at this track. I want to say it's good to see North Wilkesboro back on the schedule. The question now is, what's next? After this All-Star event, what do we go? where do we go from here? It looks like we're going to have an All-Star race here again next year. The next big thing now is a points-paying event at this track in the conversation to be on the schedule in 2024. I would be absolutely all right if we put it back on the schedule. As long as we can figure out the short track product for this next-gen car. We have North Wilkesboro back in NASCAR. And the other thing to be thinking about is, what are we going to do about the racing service? It is old and abrasive. We did have to put down some patches in areas that needed to be adjusted. And I felt like they did a really good job. But what can we do? Because you can't run the high side and pass guys unless if you have fresher tires than the guy you're racing. Or you got to get a guy out the bottom by bumping him and move him out of the way. It's like bump and run. That's obviously what short track racing is all about but is eventually a repave in discussion. I mean, Marcus Smith said, until it, the racetrack gets old and abrasive and too much that we can't run the surface anymore, we'll repave it. So it sounds like the repave decision is on hold, but it still could maybe make a step earlier if it is a little too much for the racing competitors. But the whole weekend, to have North Wilkesboro back on the schedule unbelievable the fan attendance i loved it the atmosphere the pre-race driver intros with d'angelo williams a former running back for the carolina panthers i love that it was just a good weekend to have an old friend in north wilkesboro back on the nascar schedule now that all-star weekend's done it's time for memorial day weekend and that means the three biggest races of the day wake up for the monaco grand prix have a nice lunch for the indianapolis 500 with the greatest men to go in racing and next Sunday night, the longest race of the schedule, the Coca-Cola 600. 600 miles of remembrance of the men and women serving in our military and those that we have lost. We honor you and we will never forget your sacrifice for serving for our country in the military. All that, plus seeing those wonderful American patriotic paint schemes riding around the track for 400 laps, 600 miles. One of the longest races of the year. And last year's race was one of the best 600s in a long, long time. That next-gen car at the center of last year was fantastic. We'll see how it does for year number two, and I cannot wait for it. And I'm particularly excited because next weekend, I will be attending my first ever Coca-Cola 600, and I cannot wait. I made the decision earlier this year and I kept it quiet until now to say, you know what? I haven't been to the Coca-Cola 600. I've been to the fall races, but I've never been in the 600 mile race. So I took money out of my own pocket to pay a ticket to go see this race next weekend. And I cannot wait. Hopefully the weather is good for one thing. I don't want to jinx early ahead, but I hope the weather is good. And also I will be attending the truck race on Friday night, the North Carolina Education Lottery 200. I'm looking forward to that race. Plus there are no cup competitors allowed because it's part of the triple truck challenge race. So that means no Kyle Busch, but it'll still be a fun, fun weekend. And I cannot wait to be there for two out of the three events on Memorial Day weekend. So Will Denny Hamlin retain his supremacy from last year's race and win his second Coca-Cola 600? Can Kyle Larson and Chase Briscoe make up for the one that slipped right through their hands and laid the closing laps of race last year? Or will the track house cars that were very strong last year and Daniel Suarez and Ross Chastain make up for one they felt like could have they could have captured last year and get to victory lane next weekend? That remains to be seen when we run those 600 miles. So I'm looking forward to it. I can't wait to be there. And I can't wait to be there for the, again, for the cup race and the truck race this week. It's going to be a hell of a weekend. And I hope everybody enjoyed the all-star race at North Wilkesboro this weekend. And hopefully we have North Wilkesboro 
for more events down the road now that it's back in the NASCAR circuit schedule. So looking forward to uh, next weekend. I hope you all enjoyed this uh, All-Star Race last night. So subscribe, like, congrats once again to Kyle Larson and the five team on their impressive, dominant victory at the All-Star Race in North Wilkesboro. Have a wonderful week, everybody. Let's go racing.